on how. There we go. All right. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we have Dr. Grinspoon, um, and we have no agenda. We're just going to sort of riff and talk, um, ask questions. Um, so please, if you have questions, you can either um, click by your name and raise your hand, and, and we can unmute you, um, or um, you can just type your question under um, the chat, uh, whatever is easiest. Um, we will not announce names, so people watching the video won't know who you are. Um, but if you want to be anonymous, you can also change your name. Um, all right, so Peter, I guess we'll start, we'll start with um, softball questions. Um, tell us about how you ended up loving working with cannabis. Well, <clears throat> you know, I was involved with cannabis my whole life. Um, you know, I like to joke about how I'm uh, 54 years old, but I've been involved with cannabis for 55 years because my, my dad was a big um, cannabis expert. Um, you know, and even in utero, I, you know, I can't say I remember, but I'm sure I heard him talking about it, my, my, myself and my twin brother, because our, our childhood home was a big hotbed of cannabis activism. I mean, literally growing up um, in my childhood living room were either um, cannabis activists like peaceably smoking a joint together or, you know, angrily arguing and throwing things at each other. So, you know, I, I've been exposed for better or for worse to this issue my, my entire life. And, you know, this was also sort of either compounded or complemented by the fact that my, my brother Danny unfortunately passed away when I was eight he was 16, but my parents illegally got him medical cannabis to use for his cancer-induced nausea and vomiting. They were very desperate because he couldn't eat at all. My mom actually, unknown to my dad, procured him some can cannabis. Uh, she went to Wellesley High School and went to a friend <laughs> of my brother Danny's, uh, who they're still friends with actually, um, you know, like 50 years later, and said, can we, can I buy some medical cannabis? And he was like, Mrs. Grinspoon, what are you talking about? This is like this teenage kid, but he got some um, for her. And, you know, he was able to tolerate the chemotherapy and eat for the last couple of years of his life, hold down food, which he was unable to do. Um, you know, this was in the 1970s. They didn't have Odansetron. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went to, into medical school, like completely like pro medical cannabis. And sort of immune to all the, the bullshit they teach us in medical school. I mean, it's really pathetic what they teach us, especially what they taught us. I'm hoping it's a little bit better now, but I, uh, and you're a little bit younger than me, but do you remember what they taught us? It was nonsense. Right, it's all about addiction. It had nothing yeah, to do with Exactly, and abuse. Yeah. yeah, that's all. And they, they, they might have mentioned like a word or two about like hypothetical medical uses. Whereas in reality, they should be teaching us about the endocannabinoid system and everything else. So um, I've been involved in the medical cannabis issue my whole life. And really, as a doctor for 25 years, it's been a pretty integral part. I'm a primary care doctor. And it's been a pretty integral part of what I do as a primary care doctor. And, you know, the biggest secret and sort of the biggest, the last laugh of all is that it makes my life easier as a primary care doctor. You know, I don't have to use Ambien when people have insomnia. I don't have to use opiates or necessarily non-steroidals when people have chronic pain. It actually makes my life a lot easier as a primary care doctor. I mean, especially now in Massachusetts that is legal, mm -hmm. but all along it's made my life a lot easier because I've had more tools than a lot of the other doctors have because I've been able to recommend cannabis. So. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that's always struck me, Peter, is, is how um, not only sort of appreciated and, and, and praised um, within what are normally considered very conservative circles. Um, but you seem to have been, I don't know, almost appointed a liaison for cannabis at MGH or at, you know, within the partner system. Um, can you tell me, I guess, or everybody about how that happened? How did, how did you, I mean, there must've been limitations. There must've been borders that you had to push through or how did that all work? Well, part of it is that I'm respectful and I listen to other people's opinions. And I try not to get too bent out of shape about them. And I also try to understand where people are coming from. Um, you know, people really haven't been exposed to two sides of this issue. And if they haven't ever been exposed to two sides of this issue, they're not going to have a very nuanced view of it. So I try to be really patient uh, with people. 
and people are changing um, and they are open. Doctors are starving for information about this. Mm -hmm. And they're really tired of not knowing how to answer patients when patients ask them about it. Mm -hmm. And they wanna be informed about it and they wanna have a, a, a nuanced answer and a nuanced understanding. So mm -hmm. I think part of it was just being in the right place at, at the right time. Mm -hmm. And you know, part of it's also being reasonable. Like I actually, do believe that there's a cannabis withdrawal syndrome like i'm sure you do too and some people would say some people automatically dismiss everything negative about cannabis as propaganda and i can understand that impulse because everything about propaganda for 80 everything about cannabis was propaganda for 80 years but we've got to be objective not completely positive or completely negative we've got to be objective if we're going to attain credibility. And I think I'm, I'm pretty good at, at trying to be objective. And you take something like cannabis withdrawal, like a lot of cannabis advocates would just say, it doesn't cause withdrawal. It didn't cause withdrawal when I stopped it for two weeks. But, you know, if you have receptors in your brain and you stimulate them all the time, they downregulate. It's true for SSRIs. It's true for benzodiazepines. It's true for opiates. And of course it's true if someone smokes cannabis every day, then they stop smoking. It's totally reasonable that you're brain would be hungry for that stimulation and you might feel grumpy and have insomnia. So mm -hmm. I just try to take a, a balanced view of it. And I think mm -hmm. that that's part of how people on, on both quote unquote sides mm -hmm. sort of at least listen to me. They don't always agree with me, but I don't, you know, and I try not to make people feel bad about how they feel. Mm -hmm. You know, you just listen to people and respect them. I think that's a mm -hmm. big, a big key because, you know, I, I don't want to give a whole Ted talk, but I think it's really problematic that we have, these two narratives about cannabis that don't really overlap. We've got the, it's like a Venn diagram that barely, mm -hmm. they barely touch each other. You know, the pro cannabis people, a lot of them just bristle if you say anything negative about it. Like right. if a study comes out, this like you're stabbing product, them in the heart. Yeah. Yeah. And the anti cannabis people won't admit anything positive about it. And like any medicine, of course, it's going to have its side effects and its downsides. But it's a remarkably versatile and effective medication for so many things. Mm -hmm. And I just don't understand this reflexive, like it's got to be perfect or terrible. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, it's going to be in the middle, like any other medication we've ever used. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you think, so we obviously live in a very polarized culture now for most things, whether it's social stuff or political stuff, people are either way right or way left or way red or black or whatever. Um, do you, do you think the polarized views on pro and anti-cannabis is a new thing or is that an old thing? Well, it's interesting. I think in one way it's an old thing because, you know, you go back to the, for example, the times of Nixon and like, you know, the Vietnam War protesters and, you know, cannabis use and promotion was very much linked to like the anti-war left Mm -hmm. And it, unfortunately, it really became like a Republican Democrat issue. Mm -hmm. But ironically, I see support for cannabis sort of transcending typical polarization now. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of my supporters on Twitter are like Trump supporters because they're pro cannabis. You know, of course, then they dump me the minute I say something against Trump. But, you know, generally speaking, they're like pro, pro you know, I think cannabis in some ways can be a way to really unite the country. I mean, right. I'm a little bit mystified why the current Republicans are so anti-cannabis when 53% of Republicans nationally are in favor of legalization. I mean, right. granted, you know, many more Democrats than Republicans are in favor of legalization, but more than half of Republicans are in favor of recreational legalization or adult use legalization. Hmm. And in terms of medical marijuana, it's very hard to find anybody that's against medical marijuana, Republican mm -hmm. or Democrat. So I'm a, I'm a little bit, just like doctors have been way behind their patients in terms of coming into the modern world of cannabis. I think the Republicans are sort of, politicians are sort of behind their constituents, mm -hmm. certainly with regard to medical cannabis, but I think also with regard to just legalizing. I mean, you know, crime goes down, um, revenue goes up, health improves. Like, what's to be against? I'm a little bit <laughs> mystified by the whole thing, to be right. honest. And right. I don't no, see it just because it was right just because it was a hippie versus pro war thing 40 years ago doesn't mean it has to be now right
Right. So actually blending those, those two concepts we raised there um, for patients who have interest in cannabis and they're, you know, seeing a doctor and they're, they're either not sure how the doctor is feeling, going to feel about it, or they have, have heard, you know, persnickety comments about <laughs> cannabis. How do you, how do you suggest that they engage with that scenario? Well, you know, that's the biggest problem is that patients don't trust doctors to not be snippy and judgmental when they talk to them about cannabis. And the worst case scenario is when you have patients using cannabis and not talking to their doctors and then, you know, having, again, these, these two information systems, you're seeing your doctor, but then you're also taking care of other parts of your health with cannabis and you're not combining the two. Mm -hmm. And I think the doctors have done a really big disservice to medicine and to themselves and to their patients by being, I think, persnickety is even a better word than the word I usually use, which is snippy, but sort of snooty and, and dismissive about patients mm -hmm. and cannabis, because you've got to create an environment where, where your patient's comfortable talking to you, yeah. or you're just not going to be a good caregiver, and you're not going to have a su successful doctor-patient interaction. I agree. I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a funny scenario from my view. I think... Um, on the one hand, I am, I think it's unethical actually for doctors not to be learning and at least encouraging patients to learn or explore. I think it's, it's unethical for them not to do that. Um, but I also understand that doctors, you know, particularly conservative doctors or old doctors, um, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And we have, we thought that we were taught this, you know, whole picture. And wait a minute, like there's a huge piece that's missing. That's a huge, that's a, that's a very intimidating um, undercutting, I guess, of, of, of a doctor's ego and, and sense of authority and, you know, puts them in a vulnerable position because we're supposed to be these icons of, of knowledge. And wait a minute, there's a big chunk missing that I, I, people are aware of. And that's sort of like doctors are almost naked in that sense. Um, right. Well, it depends what type of doctor you are, I think, a little bit. Like, primary care doctors are so used to saying, I don't know. Like, those are the three most important words in my job. If somebody, mm -hmm. As long as somebody knows it, that's great. I, of course, I don't know everything. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not an oncologist. You know, and the, it, what's most important is that I find somebody that knows the answer and steer the patient to that. I mean, I know a lot, but I also don't know a lot. And the most important thing is to not know, to know what I don't know. Right. And I think humility is like the most important characteristic um, for a doctor, literally right. is the most important thing. And I think that the medical profession has been so lacking in humility. And I think cannabis is like the perfect example. Like the medical profession completely got it wrong. We bought all the drug war propaganda, mm -hmm. uh, hook, line and sinker. We actually participated in the drug war and perpetuated all this propaganda and these myths. We actually mm -hmm. harmed people and now, instead of saying, what can we learn? You know, we don't know about this. Let's start from scratch and let's learn about this really fascinating neurotransmitter system, the endocannabinoid system, and let's listen to people. Let's listen to our patients. Um, you know, doctors just try to preserve, you know, this facade of like, we know everything when they don't. And all it does is erode their credibility with patients and mm -hmm. patients end up going elsewhere. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's really interesting because like you're a medical cannabis doctor. So any patient that goes to you is going to be open with you about their cannabis use and mm -hmm. you're going to be accepting and that's what they're going to expect of you. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case for your average doctor. Right. Patients are terrified and I'm sure they tell you right. that they went to their doctor and they got shot down and that's right. part of why they're talking to you. Right. And it just shouldn't be that way. That's so right. wrong. Right, right, right. No, and I, I think to your point earlier, it's really about the doctor being available for patients. I mean, I, I didn't start off as a cannabis doctor. I started off as, as a primary care doctor like you. And, I, and, and like you, I listened to people and I was just so overcome with passion for what patients were teaching me that this was helping them, that I was so misinformed um, that it, you know, I, I saw the opportunity. Um, so let's jump to questions. We have a bunch of questions pouring in and, and it, I'm really grateful that people are asking them in the chat. I also got a couple over email. Um, so the question here is, as a neuroscientist who studies opioids and cannabinoids, I find a lot of individuals who are looking for information about cannabis when doctors won't provide any information and it can put us in a weird position. Um, this, I guess, is neuroscientists or people who are not you know, necessarily medically trained. Um, what might be the best way to go about um, helping to educate them? 
Well, I would say that, first of all, um, there's nothing wrong with educating them as long as you're not giving them clinical advice. You could speak, you know, you could say this is what cannabis can do and what it can't do, and these are the side effects, and this is the way in which it can supplant opiates. And then I would say, in that, in that case, you, have, you probably should have like a cadre of um, cannabis savvy physicians that you could refer to. Like we're allowed to do telemedicine now. Yep. So it used to be a real problem when everybody had to see their doctor in person. Uh, so you'd be sort of stuck if the person were in a different state. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it still is a bummer if you're in, you know, Oklahoma and there's no medical cannabis. But I think for most states have some medical cannabis program. Mm-hmm. And there are people like you or me who could consult on telemedicine. Mm-hmm. So I would say you're allowed to educate them, just not provide clinical advice. Yeah. And then if they need clinical advice, find someone like Ben or me or someone locally, ideally someone locally who mm-hmm. can either be their doctor or consult with them and work with them as their doctor. Mm-hmm. And then, then you just hope that they have medical cannabis in their state. If they don't have medical cannabis in their state, they're faced with very bad options. They're either going to, what, stick with opiates or use cannabis illegally. That's a horrible choice. Well, or CBD. I mean, I, yeah, I think there's, there's still some CBD options that are better than others. But yeah, no, I agree. I think I would add, I would add, I completely agree. I think I would add to that, that even on a local scale, you know, siblings, friends, um, anybody really, anybody around you, um, if you have someone around you who's asking about cannabis or curious and talking about it, I think helping people disassemble stigma um, can be miraculous. I mean, I think just someone else who's okay with it or not judging me about it, I think that's so powerful. Um, I, can I ask you a question about that question? Of course. Have you had many patients who have had like opiate level pain that you've been able to get off with just CBD? Because mm-hmm. I often find CBD isn't quite strong and that you actually do need the THC if they're at opiate level pain. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I, I, what, I'm, what I'm finding from, from looking through my patients is about 10% or less of patients who are consuming just CBD. So the stuff you know sold at malls or uh, Whole Foods or whatever, um, it's really pure CBD. That stuff is just not doing it for, for most people. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm toying with the idea lately because of the um, antagonist features of CBD at CB1. Um, for, for people who don't speak science speak, that's basically um, CBD has the, has the power um, to block, but not totally block CB1 receptors. And and to attach to that the fact that it is blocking the degradation of our natural endocannabinoids. That's one of the things that CBD does. I think folks who start off with a more healthy endocannabinoid system, um, and what I mean by that is folks who don't have a deficiency, they're not sort of missing some endocannabinoids. Um, you know, and these are all terms that we're kind of making up because we don't fully understand the whole system. But basically there seems like there are people who have a, a healthy, um, let's call it usual endocannabinoid system. And there are folks who have less than usual. Um, I think, you know, maybe we could think about people who are giggly or are naturally happy, or maybe all dogs, maybe all canines have a really healthy <laughs> endocannabinoid system. But then there are people who are by nature, maybe more melancholy or maybe more um, unsettled or people who are baseline anxious, you know, whatever, whatever it is that endocannabinoid deficiency turns out to be. Um, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a correlation, I think, with which people are responding to CBD. Um, and I think the people who have a baseline deficiency in endocannabinoids might not respond as well. Um, that those kinds of people need a little bit of extra oomph, which would be sort of THC and, and, and um, CB1 receptor activation. You know, I, I would completely agree with that. Awesome. So we have another another question. Actually, this one is juicy. Got got um, over over email. Um, so this question is: uh, So the president of the United States has appointed you to the head task force for implementation of a nationwide legalization of medical cannabinoids. Do you integrate cannabinoids into the normal way of doing things in medicine or medical care, or do you make a special standalone medical cannabinoid program, or perhaps a mix? Well, that's interesting. We might have actually different answers to that. Um, I, as a primary care doctor, I find it really helpful to integrate it into primary care. And I would love it if all primary care doctors just were really, if I could wave a magic wand 
and all primary care doctors are really enthusiastic, educated, and competent with medical cannabis. I think the use of other medications would go down drastically. Again, you know, why go right to Ambien if someone or a, a really strong sleeping heavy duty tranquilizer is having trouble sleeping when they could gently a couple of drops of cannabis tincture a little bit more than that. Hang on, Peter, it sounds like maybe your dog is chewing on your microphone or something covering your microphone. He's not in here. I, I don't see him okay. chewing. There um, we go. That's clear. All right. Um, I mean, why use, you know, heavy duty tranquilizers when you could just use a couple of drops of cannabis tincture and drift off to sleep? And why wreck your, your kidney with non-steroidals, you know, Advil, ibuprofen, naproxen, when you could take a, a low dose of of THC with a little CBD and take the edge off the pain. So mm -hmm. I really think that if it were legal and you could just integrate it into primary care and then the specialists could help out too, if all the doctors were comfortable with it and they could just integrate it into current medical practice, I think that would go really smoothly. Mm -hmm. And then for complicated cases, we'd have medical cannabis specialists like Ben, just like, you know, I can take care of high blood pressure as a primary care doctor, but then when I can't take up high blood pressure, I send them to a cardiologist or a nephrologist, a kidney specialist. And then someone who does just that, who reads all the literature and is really good at it, much better than I am, can take care of the really complicated issue. And in a way that would be much better for you too, because you get to do the really interesting cases. You wouldn't just have to do the day to day. So I would vote for integrating it into, um, primary care and usual medicine and then save the really complicated cases for the specialists and then the specialists can focus on becoming really specialized and digging deep into it and they wouldn't have to worry about just certifying people and helping make it legal for them you you could actually devote all of your time to becoming really specialized i think it'll work out yeah. really well for everyone yeah no actually i completely agree i think i think from a public health perspective we're going to do the most good when everybody knows at least a basic amount and is involved in everyday cannabis decisions. I think that's, it's as cannabis will be as bread and butter as Tylenol leads to ibuprofen leads to other choices. I think it's, it's, it's bread and butter medicine. I think I agree. I would love to specialize and focus on the more complex cases. I actually happen to love the simple stuff now. Um, so it's just kind of a pig and slop. I love everything I'm doing, but, but I think from a public public health perspective, yeah. Um, a question that ties into this, um, in almost all chronic pain guidelines, cannabis is a third line treatment. As a primary care physician and a cannabis specialist, do you prescribe the first and second line drugs and prescribe cannabis only if, it, if there isn't a better option or are you prescribing cannabis at the beginning of the treatment? Well, it depends, first of all, a little bit on patient preference. Um, and those guidelines are, I believe, are really affected by sort of like the last 80 years of sort of suppression of cannabis and that a lot of the studies have been focused on harms, not in benefits. I truly think that if we started from scratch and then studied everything equally, um, we would, uh, cannabis would not be a third line treatment for pain. I think it would be first line. Um, in fact, I'm positive of it. I mean, there's so many reasons that would take up this whole conversation why cannabis has been given sort of short shrift in the scientific literature. Um, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse has been funding by a ratio of 20 to one, according to a recent study, harms over benefits. Mm -hmm. And the weed that you get to study is this really crappy weed from a farm in Mississippi that NIDA grows. You can't even get good cannabis from the local dispensary. You have to use really crappy government marijuana. And then a lot of the studies look at one data point, pain, whereas cannabis does a lot of things at once. It helps with anxiety, pain, and sleep. And they don't usually study like three or four things at once, but it's so much more effective than it shows up in these you know, specific studies that they're looking for. And also not to mention it's hard to blind um, cannabis. Uh, people tend to know if they're stoned or not. So it's, it's, I actually think cannabis would be a first um, line treatment. But in my practice, I talk, talk to my patients, you know, and it's very different. If someone says, I've used cannabis a lot when I was younger, I didn't have any negative experiences with it and I'd like to try it. I'm like, sure, of course, absolutely. Whereas if someone, you know, is, says, I, I used to smoke, I tried it, it made me really anxious, I didn't like it at all, then I'm happy to use it, to not use cannabis and to try the more traditional things that other doctors would do. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the patient's experience. Mm -hmm. And it also depends on their, their medical conditions. You know, if they have kidney failure, 
of course I can't use non-steroidals. Mm -hmm. Tylenol doesn't do anything, so then it's opiates versus cannabis. Um, I don't think, I think right. you'd have to be out of your mind to try opiates before cannabis. But according to the quote unquote guidelines, you know, you probably try opiates first. So right. I would actually throw away the guidelines rather than, um, that would be my first step to be honest. I agree, I agree, I agree completely. Um, I think, yeah, it's amazing how, how, looking now sort of back on how things have been um, and seeing in the, forward, in, 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 in the future where things will be, it's a real pivot point in our culture as far as medicine goes. Um, Can I just add one thing? If you follow the guidelines, you literally destroy everybody's kidneys in a matter of decades by giving them yeah. non-steroidals unnecessarily because you could have given them cannabis all along. Mm -hmm. So just that one sentence sort of indicts the guidelines right there. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, one one um, point, I think last week or maybe the week before, I think the House or maybe it's all of Congress um, adjusted the guidelines to allow or maybe they're voting on it. I mean, we have actually a, a brilliant lawyer in the audience who can help, but um, I think the guidelines have shifted so that people can study locally grown cannabis now. I think that is a recent change from the week, last week or two. Oh yeah, they're gonna, right. That is a recent change. Are they right. gonna vote on that or do they change I, it? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I think sure. they're gonna vote Proposed on it. Bill. So, Proposed bill, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, it's so I'm ridiculous though yet. that you literally can't go next door to the dispensary to get cannabis to right. study. Ludicrous, absolutely. I always wonder what would happen. Would you lose your federal funding? Uh, I mean, it, you, I guess there must be some federal, it's a controlled one substance, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's really an interesting thing is, is um, you know, what part of, part of cannabis medicine, part of regular medicine is, is just therapy. It's just kind of doing what's right, not necessarily what's legal. And, and that's an interesting problem for our culture, I think. You know, doctors ha are so caught up in doing what's right and doing what we're taught and following the algorithm that it's been so hard for them to think outside the box. Um, right, so but I if think I think outside the box and I cost MGH all of their federal funding, I think they'd be upset with me. So, <laughs> you know, there are, yeah, you do affect other people. <laughs> right, no, for sure. Um, so here's, here's another question. Um, actually, I want to go back to, to a question that came up before, and I'm, I wonder what your answer is. Actually, we had a whole webinar about it, but um, the question is, is about cannabis and coronavirus. Um, and what's your understanding about the interaction and, and can cannabis cure coronavirus? Well, the answer is, first of all, we don't know. It's a new virus. We don't know what cures it. And, but in a, in a nutshell, um, you know, people are saying that it, because cannabis, CBD in particular, uh, dampens, you know, the cytokine response, does it have a role in the cytokine storm? But the problem is, to the extent that cannabis might suppress your immune response in the second half, you know, you need your immune response to be as strong as possible right when you get coronavirus, to, so that you don't get a severe case. So cannabis, if it's immunosuppressant, would actually undermine your body's response at the very beginning. But then if you do get the coronavirus attacks your lungs and you have a cytokine storm and so forth, then cannabinoids could actually help you if it helps stop your body from being overzealous in the response um, to the virus. So I don't think you could say like cannabis in general helps against the coronavirus because it might really undermine your initial response and it might help the secondary response if you get a really severe attack by your body against your lungs. But I do think there's potential for specific cannabinoids like CBD, which do tamp down the immune system theoretically to help, but it's too early to tell. I mean, some of these people came out with really dishonest studies. You know, they showed that in a lab that some of the cytokines were, or some of the ACE receptors were less, which is how the coronavirus uh, attaches to the body were, were sort of like um, underrepresented if you, fed the cells CBD and then they said aha this cures coronavirus but it's like let's just put it in the mouthwash but you know you gargle with like Listerine and your breath stays fresh for like you know a minute or two I mean how is that really going to stop the coronavirus from attacking and attaching to your body I thought it was so speculative and right. so um over about the Israeli study yeah, and one in Canada too. So mm -hmm. I really don't think you could say anything because it's a new virus and a lot of studying. The only thing you can really say is that there's potential. And 
this is why it needs to be fully legal. Cannabis needs to be fully legal and we need to be pouring research in because there's such potential. But I do think that a lot of people sort of jumped the gun and like made these like really irresponsible claims that cannabis can, can uh, treat or control or help, you know, improve the coronavirus. If anything, I, I'm a little bit concerned about people smoking cannabis because because smoking, well, smoking cannabis has never been shown to cause lung cancer or COPD. It, it does cause like a chronic bronchitis if you smoke it heavily every day. And you don't want your lungs to be irritated because the way that coronavirus tends to kill people is by attacking the lungs. So we've been advocating that people switch to, you know, tinctures or sublingual or topical or edibles, or if anything, vaping ground flour just to protect their lungs because um, you, you just want to make your lungs as healthy as possible. You don't really want to smoke anything. So paradoxically, I think that smoking cannabis might actually harm your chances if you smoke it heavily every day against the coronavirus. And I don't think there's really any evidence one way or another, um, good evidence, though there is potential about how coronavirus actually, about how cannabis actually helps or hurts with the coronavirus. That's good. All right. So another great question. Um, how do we go, this is harking back to our previous conversations, how do we go about shifting the paradigm in the immediate future? Um, how do we get the majority of healthcare providers on board with the idea that many of these chronic ailments are tied to ECS health and that cannabis is a viable treatment option? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is, well, there are a lot of things we have to do, but we have to teach the endocannabinoid system in medical schools. I mean, a recent study showed that it's taught in 13% of medical mm -hmm. schools. And as you know, the endocannabinoid system is like foundational. It's like the control system for all the other neurotransmitter systems. It like upregulates them or downregulates them. And it's completely crazy that you don't teach this in medical schools. So, I mean, I think that we are slowly getting doctors up to speed. It should be happening much more quickly. I think part of it's pressure from patients part of its personal experience. I mean, if you're a doctor or anybody and you have a relative or a friend that has a really good experience with medical cannabis, your attitude is just going to change. And I think part of it is that there are educational courses, you know, and there are a lot of groups, a lot of the Seed Foundation does a lot of education. My group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, does a lot of education. And there are a lot of other really good groups doing education. So I think the education is sinking in, but I think it would sink in a lot quicker if doctors had a basic understanding of the endocannabinoid system. I mean, if you understand the endocannabinoid system, it's really hard not to believe in medical cannabis because it's so obvious how it could help and how it could not help and the ways in which it could help and the ways in which we could use, utilize it and, and harness it. So mm -hmm. I really think we need to reformulate the, the education in medical schools mm -hmm. and get rid of all the drug war ideology Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of um, opportunity in continuing medical education. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of nonsense out of there. I mean, you look at some of the stuff that's taught at like ASAM, the American mm -hmm. Society of Addiction Medicine, and mm -hmm. a lot of the addiction people are still not on board at all. And they're still like just teaching this nonsense. And a lot of the psychiatrists, I mean, even at my hospital, the psychiatrists are still really against it, less against it than they used to be because they want to stay relevant. Um, and if they stayed still in the reefer madness phase of life, they'd be completely irrelevant and no one would even interview them or, or talk to them or fund them, but they still have to be against it. So they're, they're shifting as society shifts, they shift to be just against it enough to stay relevant as, as against it as they possibly can. So, right. but we, there's so many opportunities. So I just think it's a question of education mm -hmm. and a question of time. I mean, I think we're getting there, but it's sort of embarrassingly slow. I mean, how is it that Mexico and Canada are going to be legal before the United States is. I mean, it's right. a little bit embarrassing. And, and the right. problem is if we legalize, I think it's going to make it a lot harder for any of these doctors to uh, just stick to the, the, the drug war, you know, speech about how it's a dangerous drug of abuse without mm -hmm. medical uses. I mean, it's just, gonna, it's, it, it, the illegality provides cover for the propaganda. And I think yeah. that cover would be gone if we just make more progress politically. Yeah, um, I think something's covering your mic again, or, is it, or maybe it's going in and out. Um, Let me try readjusting a little bit. There we go. That's better. Um, I imagine the mic sort of hanging by a thread is how it sounds. Yeah, um, I have a better. Okay, that's better. That's better. Okay. All right. Um, so actually, there's a question. The question came up that that highlights one of the points we were just talking about. Um, so you were you were talking about teaching about the endocannabinoid system in medical school. 
this question sort of moves it into the hospital setting and tying, I think, the question with um, what you and I have talked about as far as what they can do in hospitals versus outpatient. And the question is, um, why are some of the large hospital systems um, instructing providers to not participate in medical programs? I, I assume she means medical cannabis programs. Um, how can you provide access to how can you provide access to providers for patients in all states that are experiencing this? So I think I think the question is getting at you know inpatient what's in, allowed inpatient outpatient et cetera. Right. Well, it's actually there's two issues because it's interesting. Like the Cleveland Clinic, for example, said we just don't do medical cannabis, and we're telling all of our doctors not to prescribe it. So I think some hospital systems are more conservative than others. And I think it's a liability issue. They just don't want to get in hot water with the federal government. Whereas MGH uh, at Harvard, you know, Harvard's not necessarily a bastion of liberalism by any means, but to their credit, MGH was like, you guys can do this, you know, as long as, um, you know, you're not like setting up dispensaries in, you know, the lobby of your clinic, you know, you, you can definitely do this. They were really progressive about it. So I think it sort of depends on the hospital system and how progressive they are versus how risk averse they are. Because mm -hmm. it was really different. You know, again, Cleveland Clinic was like, we just don't do this. And I was so outraged. I'm like, how could you guys, it's, you know, legal in Ohio medically, and you guys are just saying your doctors can't do that. That's absolutely preposterous. How do you expect to be a top medical center if you're just gonna hide your head in the sand? I was, I was like embarrassed for them. And then I was really proud of MGH for, for saying that. Mm -hmm. But then, the issue came up and we had a lot of meetings with this at MGH of like, what do you do with patients who bring it into the hospital? I was like, you know, why don't we do don't ask, don't tell? Because they can't really let people bring it in because then they do get in trouble with the federal government. And, but at the same time, they don't want to take it away. Like we had these meetings, the security guards are like, we don't want to take it away. The nurses were like, we don't want to take it away. The doctors were like, we don't want to take it away. But the administrators were like, but we can't just let them have it. You know, we're going to get, you know, I forget the name of the, the governmental agency that regulates it, but we're just going to get, you know, screwed by this government. You know, they're really, they really would get in trouble with their federal funds. I mean, everybody in that room was pro-cannabis and, well, pro the right of patients to use cannabis, but they couldn't agree for hospital policy that the patients just bring in and start smoking in the hospital room because they would lose their federal funding. So I proposed a don't ask, don't tell policy and they all told me how that wouldn't work. But I honestly think that's what they're adopting because they couldn't come up with anything better. So mm -hmm. after telling me how that doesn't work at all because that's like the worst case scenario for everybody, I think they came to realize that that actually was like the best we could do right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, patients shouldn't come into the hospital and like light up a joint. And they shouldn't come into the hospital and start smoking a vape because that's so in your face. You know, it's not the hospital's fault. The security cards don't want to take it away. Nobody wants any trouble. All the nurses, I guarantee, are on your side. So if you go to the hospital, just bring some little candies in an unmarked jar that nobody's going to notice and take your medical cannabis and just be subtle about it and don't cause any friction because, again, their hands are tied. They don't want to be the bad guy, but at the same time, there's a gun against their head. There's like hundreds of millions of dollars of federal funding that they will lose. The hospital will be shut down if they turned a blind eye to this. And until we have federal legalization, there's nothing the hospitals can do. So I just think there's a compromise where the patients can be subtle and discreet and the hospitals can not be looking for trouble. And then this issue just disappears until we have legalization. Awesome. Um, so here's another related question. Um, are there any studies looking at the lung effects of vaping, dispensary vapes, as opposed to street vapes versus smoking? Um, is one safer than the other? You sort of touched on this about smoking, but I think they're looking for a little bit more um, academic integrity. Well, the thing about, I mean, a study just came out recently. Now, it's sort of a comp, that's like three different questions. But so um, Governor Baker made the vapes illegal and we, sued him. And I was actually the expert witness in the, in the law case. I know you were involved in it as well. And um, a study came out actually that showed that the vaping associated illnesses was much less prominent in the states that had legal marijuana than, 
that didn't have legal cannabis. Yeah. So that argues very strongly that it was the illegality of the vapes rather than the vapes themselves that was causing the severe lung injuries that were making people so sick. Right. So I think it was 81, to... 81% or 84% of the cases were in states that had um, mostly illegal or access to illegal products as opposed exactly. to dispensary vapes. So that was a really strong argument for, for legalization. And it was a really strong argument that a lot of the illness was from illegal chemicals or unregulated chemicals in the vapes. So the first part of the question is that legal vapes are obviously much safer than illegal vapes because they're regulated. And if it's illegal, you can put whatever you want in them. And, you know, if it's illegal, there's no regulation and people just make them really cheaply to try to make money. So I think legal is obviously a lot safer than illegal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In terms of vaping versus smoking, I think it's pretty clear that now there's two different types of vaping. And that's the other thing the governor Baker didn't understand. He made all vaping illegal. Mm -hmm. And he didn't understand that there was like vaping where you get a machine to heat up the dry flour versus those vape sticks, which have the cartridges. And he made them both illegal, which was a huge mistake. And he got clubs senseless over that. And they had to make the machines where you vape dry flour, heat up dry flour legal again, because a lot of people, that's actually the safest way. And that is clearly safer than smoking because smoking, you just combust everything at like what, 1100 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. and you get the tar and you get all kinds of um, potentially carcinogenic chemicals. Again, smoking cannabis has never been shown to cause lung cancer, but there are carcinogenic chemicals when you smoke cannabis. My theory is that that's counterbalanced by the sort of um, anti-cancer properties of um, cannabinoids. So that never, doesn't really cause lung cancer, but it's certainly not good for you. But if you just heat up the dried flour, you just get the good cannabinoids and you don't get any of the crap. So I think that's obviously a lot safer than smoking cannabis, just vaping dry flour. Mm -hmm. Now the vape cartridges are the big unknown. The legal vape cartridges are the big unknown because they have cannabinoids in them, but they also have other chemicals. And I think we just don't know how safe the legal regulated vape cartridges are. I'd be interested to know what you think about this, but I just yeah. don't think they've been studied. Um, right, no, there's, there, there's not much formal study at all, but I think what we do know from bench science is that you know, stuff that the street sells, the, the street people, anybody can look online and find vitamin E acetate. That was one of the big things that was in the news. The reason that's popular is because it's advertised as safe for consumption, meaning when someone eats it, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, nobody has thought or talked about how it would act if you're breathing it in. And obviously in retrospect, most of us now know that's not a good thing. Um, one of the problems, and it makes it a real problem for studying, is some of the cannabinoids actually convert to vitamin E acetate naturally. Um, and that's, that's a nightmare if you're looking for the absence of vitamin E acetate. You can't really have a quantity, you can have a qualitative study or a quantitative study. You can look to see how much vitamin E acetate, and if it's a negligible amount, okay, it's not a big deal, but that's a hard study to do. I think people have have looked at the statistics we were talking about that saying most dispensary products are not causing these terrible toxicity, they're not causing terrible harms. And they've extrapolated that, okay, the stuff that dispensaries are cooking vapor cartridges with, or making them to, you know, sort of creating them with is somehow safer than the stuff which is made on the street. Um, but, you know, the, the jury's still out. And I think um, more importantly, you know, I, I actually think there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue beneath vaping flour versus vaping concentrates, which is, are people vaping concentrates because they need that level of density? I mean, you know, if you like coffee, great, have coffee. Do you need quintuple espresso every morning? Maybe not. You know, I think, <laughs> well, you, you do, you're an exception to that rule. But, but I think, you know, Uncle Jane and, 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 and Auntie Jo are, are, don't need that much strength. I think people like the instant gratification but I think they don't realize that it's, it's like, it's slamming them over the head with, with more than they need. Right. Um, and it's also concerning with teenagers. It's so easy to conceal yeah. those vape sticks. Like I can't even imagine what I would have been like in high school if I had, you know, a little vape stick with like, you know, sour, 500 hits of sour diesel in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Like who would detect you? So that's another concern. I mean, it, it is. So actually I'm, I'm going to take that concern and, and jump with that to some of the juicy questions I had I, I thought about. Um, what are what is your take on 
pediatric cannabis use? And then expanding on that, what is your take on adolescents self-medicating with cannabis? Well, I assume you mean pediatric medical cannabis use. Yes. Um, not just like, you know, five-year-olds sharing joints in, doobies, in, no. in daycare. Um, so, um, you know, obviously I'm extremely sympathetic to pediatric cannabis use because I saw my, it, it such incredible value in my, my brother using it. Of course, my brother's case, he had, you know, terminal cancer. So there wasn't anybody that was going to say, oh, but well, is it going to affect his cognitive development when he's 50 because he was dying of cancer? So like there was nobody that would have had the heart to say that he shouldn't be using medical cannabis. Um, you know, for someone, a, a kid, you know, it, 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 this is, these are just the, the issues that get really complicated. Um, I mean, for most situations where a kid is so sick that they need medical cannabis, they would be, I mean, I always like to ask what else would they be on if they weren't on medical cannabis? I mean, and then whenever I ask that, like most of the time, whatever else they would be on is, is as dangerous, if not more dangerous. And for most of the kids that are sick enough to qualify for medical cannabis, we're using it instead of heavy anti-epileptics or heavy sedatives if they have autism or heavy um, psychiatric drugs. And while we don't know as much about the long-term effects of cannabis, it's really hard to imagine that it's gonna be worse mm -hmm. for the kid than those other drugs. So, and the kids are so sick, I'm, I'm always in favor of whatever helps the kids the most. I mean, you just have to realize that there's a, somewhat of an unknown. I mean, a lot of these other drugs have been tested and we know they suck, whereas cannabis might not be as dangerous. Uh, and we just, we just don't know. But I, I just think if you have a really sick kid, you'd be really hard pressed not to use cannabis if it helps. If, you're, if the alternative is to use other drugs that don't work as well that we know are re have really bad long-term effects. So I'm pretty sympathetic to it. But again, I, I do think it has to be very thoughtful. You know, you don't want your, your, your parents, like lazy parents who have a kid who have, has ADHD, just want the kid to calm down and stop annoying them, give them a gummy. Like it really has to be a thoughtful process and used, I don't want to say as a last resort, but you know, used with a lot of careful consideration. And as long as you do it that way, I'm, I'm all in favor of it. Sounds good. I think, I, so tying that with, with another fun question, um, you know, we, we often in the sort of pro-cannabis and pro-education group talk about, okay, let's, let's, let's loosen the limitations. Um, what do you think about professionals consuming cannabis? So I'm thinking about school bus drivers, pilots of airplanes, doctors, surgeons who are working, lawyers, politicians. This is a loaded um, question. Uh, right. Well, I, you know, first of all, in a perfect world, everybody would be happy and relaxed and no one would need to consume anything. But we don't live in a perfect world. We actually live in a world where people are like increasingly stressed out. And like alcohol has been the go-to drug in our society because uh, frankly, all the other options have been suppressed. And I mean, I think alcohol is a terrible drug for people to take like at the end of a long day because it like dulls you and, you know, increases domestic violence and you're hung over the next day and it kind of makes you generally kind of dumber. And I just think cannabis would be a much healthier drug than alcohol in like a million different ways for people to use for the, you know, end of the day, you're burnt out and everything hurts type thing that so many millions of Americans, tens of millions of Americans use a substance to cope with. And um, cannabis helps you connect with other people and it makes you more, you know, alert and alive and engaged in the world versus just dulled. Mm -hmm. So in general, I think cannabis should, should obviously be an option for people, it shouldn't be illegal. And I think it would be a much healthier option than alcohol, which has just been the de facto, you know, numbing intoxicant of choice because cannabis has been suppressed. Mm -hmm. Now, specifically for professionals, you know, for safety um, conscious professions like neurosurgeon and pilot, you, you obviously have to be careful, but at the same time, they're people too, and you have to allow them to, to relax and, and be human beings or they're gonna snap. You know, doctors have the highest suicide rate of any profession and they're dropping like flies. So as long as you trust people to use common sense, you know, you wouldn't want a surgeon, you know, obviously no one should use anything, alcohol or cannabis, within, you know, 
12 hours of flying a plane or performing surgery, or if you want to be really cautious, 24 hours. But I don't think there should be a blanket prohibition. I mean, mm -hmm. you talk to physicians who are suffering from burnout and it's like 55% or now they call it moral injury, not burnout, because burnout's more like blaming the individual and moral injury is more like blaming a system where you can do no right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they talk about depersonalization and discouragement and alienation and isolation. And, you know, cannabis has the potential, I'm not saying like doctors should all like run to their dispensary right now, but I'm saying like cannabis like versus alcohol has the ability to like help with all of those things. So I think it should be looked at as, you know, potentially an intoxicant if our society needs intoxicants that could be a lot healthier than alcohol. So I think it's, you know, just a, a much more interesting choice for people than alcohol. So again, in a perfect world, people wouldn't need anything, but mm -hmm. sadly, a lot of people do need something. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that cannabis could be a much healthier choice than alcohol for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree completely. I think the way that I describe it is, is similar, but nuanced in, in a way that's like, Cannabis is not just jumping off the deep end, you're, you're out stoned. You know, for some people, it's having a little bit of enriched endocannabinoids, enriched cannabinoids um, to get you to a level which is less stressed out or less in pain. Um, it doesn't have to be all the way to 10, maybe two is fine. And I think, you know, I think people have to start to understand that there's a spectrum of strength in cannabis and there's a spectrum of, of, Intoxication, I guess, if we use that word. I, although I'm, I'm, I'm less and less in liking intoxication as a word because the, the tox part of it. Um, I think there's a spectrum maybe of euphoria, and I think you know, for a lot of people, as you say, who are in pain or in, you know, stress or in these sort of deeply dysphoric states, it's nice to be a little bit closer to what most of us would consider normal. No, it's really interesting that you say that. I just have to interject because I was listening to a uh, fairly well known quote unquote cannabis quote unquote expert in Boston talk mm -hmm. on a TV show and he or she who will not be named said, you know, the thing about alcohol is that you could have a beer or two, but once you start using cannabis, you're off to the races. And I was like, this guy has never been within 10 feet of cannabis and he's clearly never tried it. And he doesn't really know anything about it. Why is he even on TV talking about it? I couldn't believe he said that. I mean, because of course you could take like a puff and be like a little bit high. You could take two puffs or you could smoke, you know, 10 bong hits of concentrate. I mean, you know, of course there's a spectrum and, you know, people who use it every day aren't very impaired if they take like a puff. They're just a little bit relaxed mm -hmm. and, you know, less in pain and a little bit euphoric, but they're completely functional. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe this cannabis quote unquote ex expert was like saying that and there's such a misconception about it and yeah. I honestly think you know I, I part of what I say is that like cannabis is different from a lot of these other drugs and you don't really understand it unless you tried it and then these addiction people shoot back at me well we don't have to try opiates to understand mm -hmm. them and I'm like well yeah of course not because opiates are harmful and you know I've been through opiate addiction and actually it really does help me understand it but I wouldn't recommend it to people because you know it could be it's obviously a traumatic and awful thing, but cannabis is not particularly harmful and used experience, lived experience can be really valuable. And if it's something like, I can't imagine being like, devoting your life to being an expert in cannabis and never trying it given how non-toxic it is. Mm -hmm. And then to be someone on TV saying something like so misinformed about cannabis, it just like blew my mind. And it just makes me appreciate your answer all the more because not that I'm inferring that you'd ever have participated in using the devil's lettuce, but I was just very impressed with the uh, subtlety and nuance of your answer. Right, no, sure, sure. Um, okay, so a couple of good questions up on the board. Um, and it looks like, wow, time has flown by, but um, I, I actually, I, I would love to keep talk talking, so I'm not, I'm not on the clock. If, what? Didn't I tell you we could talk for months? I know, no, I, and I, and I kind of want to. So if people want to stick around, they can. I'm not going to put a time limit on it. Um, all right, so the question first is, is um, harking back to our discussion about vape cartridges. Um, is there a health difference between vape cartridges with MCT oil versus using terpenes? Um, for people who aren't familiar, MCT is, is um, medium or moderate chain triglycerides, which is basically um, filtered down coconut oil to its most basic plain simple oil um, versus terpenes, these other components of, of cannabinoids, um, 
which are sometimes used um, to make vape cartridges. Um, what are your thoughts about the health differences between the makeup of the additive or the, 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 the solvent of, of cartridges? I don't, I'm gonna use my favorite three words, which are, I don't know. I don't actually know the answer to that. I don't even know if it's been studied. I, I, I'm gonna bounce that one to you, though I, I'm not sure you don't know the answer to that either. Yeah, no, I don't. Um, I, I, the, the, yeah, there's certainly no formal study. I think MCT oil is treated as inert, and I think that's a mistake. Um, I've read some literature that, that shows problems with heating up MCT oil and you get some conversion. Um, terpenes, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, still, it's still to the wind. I can guess theory, but I, I don't want to speak out of, out of theory. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one either. Theory's out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, another question um, for you. As a doctor and recovering addict, do you lean against, prescri against prescribing opiates um, or any pain meds at all? Um, no, I don't lean against them. I'm not, I'm not afraid to prescribe them at all. I think the worst thing you could do to someone who's in pain is to not treat their pain. First mm -hmm. of all, it's unethical. And second of all, having been through addiction, um, and also, you know, I've had pretty bad sciatica before. I had to have spine surgery. I know that, um, you know, being in pain is awful. It's like the worst possible thing. And if you take someone, if you don't treat someone's pain adequately, they will treat it themselves. Mm -hmm. So that is a great way to make someone um, addicted if they're not addicted anyways, is to not treat their pain. It's a really dangerous and inhumane thing to do. So I definitely treat people with opiates and I'm not afraid to treat them in high doses. And, but at the same time, I'm also very well aware on a personal as well as a professional level, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the damage that opiates can do and how dangerous they are. So I do it judiciously and I make sure to at least talk to people and say, you know, some people, like the effect of opiates so much that they can't stop taking them. I mean, it's really interesting. It's sort of like a little bit like Russian roulette. I think it's a little bit brain, like in person individual, you know, because I remember being in a physician support group meeting for other doctors that struggle with addiction. And another guy said, I had my first drink at age 14 and it made me so euphoric. I couldn't stop drinking from age 14. And to me, alcohol has never been a really very interesting drug at all. I mean, you know, I've tried every drug and alcohol is like the least interesting of all of them. Um, whereas when I tried Vicodin, I couldn't stop taking it for like the next 10 years because it just made me so euphoric. And I've tried basically every other drug and no other drug gave me any problems. It never made me want me to, never made me want to try them again, or I never had any addictive problem with them. So I think it's just, um, you just have to be careful because you don't know what your brain is going to do when you try a drug. And um, so I'm very careful prescribing opiates, but at the same time, you have to treat their pain. So all that said, I'd much rather treat someone's pain with cannabis than with opiates, because if they have chronic pain, I've just seen the lifestyle of being on opiates, both because of the way the medical system is set up. You have to be on a narcotics contract and get drug screens. Everybody treats you like you're a criminal, which isn't right or fair at all. The pharmacist, you know, the doctors, if you run out, everybody, no one believes you if you lose your prescription. Whereas if you're on cannabis, you know, instead of being like drugged out on opiates, you're like awake and alert and connecting with people. I just think it's a much better lifestyle. Um, and your quality of life is much better if you have chronic pain on cannabis than on opiates. So I certainly try to steer people towards cannabis rather than opiates. But if they need opiates or if they just don't tolerate cannabis, there's a certain percentage of people, it just makes them anxious and they don't tolerate or their pain might be too severe. I think cannabis works really well for mild to moderate pain, but if they have like really severe pain, they're going to need some opiates. So there are plenty of patients I have on opiates. There are two, two things that I think that are so obvious to you that you left out that sort of run through. And I want to make it sure, make sure that everybody understands that. Um, every decision that you make is is governed by what the patient wants Absolutely, first. Absolutely, yeah. Not you running the ship, right. No, I know that you know that, but, but it's an important thing to, yeah. to say to everybody here is that all of our decisions, I mean, this is bread and butter of all medicine, is it starts with the patient, what they want, and, and we couch that based on evidence, based on what we know from our experience um, to suit their needs. It's always the patient first. I think, I think especially with the opioid crisis, people have forgotten that or maybe don't, don't know about it, um, that there are, crazy doctors who are pill pushers, these sort of pill mill kinds of 
those are not normal people. They're not normal doctors. This is not how medicine runs in any shape or form. Um, and then the other thing I, I wanted to, to add to what you're saying is, I think the, the absence of toxicity in cannabis allows for a different philosophy of medical care where the doctor doesn't have to be in control. We don't have to sort of stand behind a desk and say what you can and can't have because if you take too much of one, you could die. Um, because, because of that safety profile, doctors have the opportunity to take a back seat to be there for patients in the way that we love to do. And we can educate them. We can guide them without needing to be in control. And I think that empowerment, that agency that we can give patients is therapeutic in its own right. I mean, we all want to be masters of our own destiny. I don't want a doctor to tell me what to do. I want to do what I think is right. And to be able to give patients the tools to do that is so gratifying for the patient and for the doctor. I think it's a win-win scenario. Well, I agree with you for some doctors, and that's where the humility comes in. Hmm. But I think for a lot of doctors, that's really uncomfortable. Like hmm. if anybody comes in for blood pressure, I'll give hmm. them 10 milligrams of lisinopril, take it every day. Hmm. You know, or if they come in for cholesterol, I'll give them a certain dose of a certain medication. Yeah. But if you certify someone for cannabis, you make recommendations, and then they basically talk to the bud tender and do whatever they want. And right. I think I love, just like you, I love the fact that it sort of empowers the patient and gives them a lot of choice and a lot of trial and error. But I think it's really counterintuitive for a lot of doctors who are used to saying, take this pill in this dose and tell me if it works. So I think that's part of what a lot of doctors are having trouble getting used to. It's like a paradigm shift. I agree, I agree. Um, so this is, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's a question we'll ask it. Um, are there enough is there enough clinical evidence of entourage effects to justify flower as a better choice than um, other forms of cannabis? Well, it depends what you mean by evidence. Um, if you talk to people, absolutely. Um, you know, the government legalized Marinol, which was synthetic THC, to try to um, give something to the legalization movement, to try to make it so they didn't have to legalize cannabis. And virtually everybody says that THC doesn't work nearly as well as cannabis, which has about you know, 600 different chemicals in it. So I would say the lived experience of virtually everybody that's used it says that the entourage effect works better than just the THC molecule. However, there haven't been, as far as I'm aware, really very many clinical studies that have that have done, you know, placebo controlled blinded studies that have compared one to the other. So I would say anecdotally, which is exactly the type of evidence that doctors don't put enough stock in, there is like overwhelming evidence for the entourage effect. But in terms of hardcore scientific evidence, I would say it hasn't really been proven. And I'm really wondering what Ben would have to say. I, I agree. I think maybe beneath that question is the sort of truthfulness of the entourage effect. And I think that's, um, as we're learning more about cannabis, as studies are becoming more nuanced um, and understanding of, of various receptors um, in addition to CB1 and CB2, I think the idea of entourage effect is becoming um, clarified, is, is coming into focus. Um, I think originally when the entourage effect became a thing, became an, un an understood concept. Um, it was really to exemplify what you're, the point you're making, which is individual compounds don't work as well as when there are many. Um, and that seems to be a fact. You know, when, when people, like we were talking about CBD, when they're taking CBD, it doesn't work as well as when you have a bunch of other stuff. Um, so to that patient's question, um, flour, as, as you highlighted, has everything that the plant naturally produces. So there's like hundreds of different compo components. It's not just C CBD, it's not just THC. There's a hundred of other, other things in there too. Um, so in that sense, yes, flour is going to bring more to the table than not flour. Um, you know, dispensaries as companies produce products which can taste the same every time we buy them. Um, so they have to have a smaller selection of ingredients whether that's sugar or syrup or oil or THC or CBD. They have to limit what they're 
producing so that people who buy from them have the same product over time. Um, that makes them automatically inferior to flour. Um, as far as chemistry is concerned, as far as the effects of cannabis con are concerned. Um, my hunch is that the entourage effect is going to be something of archaic medicine. I think we're not going to talk about that as, as sort of this vague power of, <laughs> of combined cannabis. Um, I think eventually we'll understand which subcomponents of cannabis act in which ways with precision. And, you know, we're still, we're still not there yet. It's going to take a while, though, because there are a lot of components. Yeah, mathematically, it's impossible. Actually, even with I was I was talking to one of my um, one of my computer science geniuses. Patient, I have a patient who's a computer science genius, and I was trying to understand what mathematics would be required to understand the interaction with six hundred compounds in a complex brain. And he said, even um, quantum computing couldn't do that right now. Right, six hundred to the six hundredth power. I yeah, mean, like more than the whole universe or something. Yeah. Um, so another another great question. Um, so what is your opinion on docs that are concerned about prescribing pain meds that even after major surgery will only recommend Motrin and Advil? Well, that's unethical. I mean, you've got to treat people's pain. Um, in response to the fact that doctors overprescribe pain medications in the early 2000s, in the mid 2000s, um, in response to you know the kind of the propaganda the propaganda campaign by Purdue Pharmaceutical that we should use opiates for everything, uh, there's now a lot of pressure on doctors not to prescribe opiates. But the fact is, our main responsibility is to our patients, and we have to do what's right. And unfortunately, the government is prosecuting occasional doctor here and there for prescribing opiates, which is creating a, a really serious climate of fear among doctors. But no matter what, if you're a doctor, you've got to treat your patient. So I just think it's completely unethical not to prescribe pain medications for patients. Uh, you know, you don't, what the surgeons used to do, they never want to be called surgeons. They just want to operate and, you know, not be bothered. They used to give like tons of opiates so they'd never be called for refills. And they're not, they, they're not doing that anymore. You know, so if you get like your appendix out, they don't give you like 120 oxycodone. They give you like, 30 and then you can call for a refill. I think that's much better, but to give zero is absolutely ridiculous. So um, I think that they need to be reported. Um, it's just completely unethical. Um, the other thing they do is they say, call your primary care doctor. <laughs> it's like, we didn't even do the surgery. I got a call the other night. I was on call last night, actually. And it was like, I called my surgeon and I'm in a lot of surgical pain. And the surgeon said, call my primary care doctor. And I'm like, I'm not even your surgeon. How do I even know what happened? Yeah, well, they, they want us to be the pill pushers because they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to actually talk to people. And, yeah. So I actually reported it. And the head of surgery got was so upset that that happened and apologized to be in like an eight paragraph right. email. So he understood that you're not allowed to do that. So. Yeah. Um, OK, so another question, um, more regulatory question. Do you think the House will legalize cannabis at a federal level when they vote on the MORE Act later this month? Well, that's really interesting. Um, I would say definitely maybe. Uh, <laughs> it's really, it's hard to predict, you know. Um, I'm gonna say yes, but I'm just not sure. Cause you've heard, you know, you hear something, you hear some rumors of like Democrats who are dissenting and, you know, there's a lot of pressure from the Republicans. I mean, they're complaining that the Democrats mentioned cannabis more than jobs in the Corona virus relief bill and there's a lot of pressure against it from Republicans but I don't understand what again what the big deal is like the, everybody should be in favor of this it creates jobs it creates tax revenue and it frees up the prisons so you know it's, there's just it's win 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 for everybody so I'm going to guess yes and then the big question is going to be what happens next because I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on Mitch McConnell in the Senate not to just sit on it um, like he does in all the other bills that the Democrats pass. So my guess is yes, but I, I don't have a crystal ball. The crystal ball is broken. <laughs> I, 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 just for my own political future and my own uh, public profile, I don't comment on, on, on political stuff at all. Um, but I think, I think there's no future without cannabis being mainstream. I think the train is out of the, the horse is out of the barn, the train is out of the station. And, and really, if we look at the past, people, we are where we are today against the most adverse odds. 
I mean, it's been illegal. It's been socially stigmatized. It's been, you know, it's been every enemy is against cannabis and for it to be pushing through all of those barriers just speaks for itself. I think this is part of a human culture. It has been forever. Um, I don't think there's, there's an educated culture which wouldn't have it. And I think, you know, maybe, you know, to your point, maybe it takes the US being the last one to the table, but I think it's gonna happen. Um, and, and I'm also, you know, aware of multiple scenarios where that's happening, whether it's in backroom channels or, you know, we all know about the, the, the Congress sort of making decisions. I think it's happening, it's just a matter of time. Um, so it looks like we're out of questions, um, unless people are ferociously typing. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to keep going. Are you, are you on a time schedule? I'm not on a time schedule. It has been a, a long day, so. Um, okay. Should we let you sleep? I wanna, I wanna keep talking for hours. Well, I would say, right, so let's, let's sleep, but why don't we do this again? Yes, yeah, yeah, no, I think we have to. I think this has been so much fun. I mean, if, if forget the audience, I would do this with you anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I was really enjoying it when we were doing it for coffee before the stupid pandemic got in the way. We yeah. used to do this about every month or so over coffee. Yeah. Of course, the audience didn't get to listen, but it was really fun. But I think it's, I think it's great. I think people should listen. I think maybe next time um, we could have maybe another moderator and, and we can both chime in. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel a little bad that I got to chime in a lot more than you did. Oh, no, I love it. I, Peter, I could hear you talk all day long. It's great. Let's get like Shaleen to be the moderator or someone like that. Would, yeah, I know, totally. Or Barry McNabb or somebody. That'd be so That'd fun. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for, for attending. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, if anybody has interest, um, we will uh, record it. So I guess tell people that you had a good time. If you did, if you learned something, tell people and, and you know, we'll make this available to, to people who couldn't make it. Um, and again, we'll have more um, keep tuned for events, I guess, on, on my website, cedclinic.com slash events. Um, or you can email me if you want. Um, and thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks, everybody.